Hello. Today it's diodes. They're tricky. Diodes are a quantum electrodynamical device and we have to talk about quantum systems. But let's get started. There's a, well, there used to be an author uh, called Terry Pratchett. Uh, he wrote a book series called Discworld. I just love his quotes. So my definition of magical is, well, not definition, but the fact that you know how it works doesn't mean it stops being magical. I find that as m the more I look into how diodes work and sort of the fundamental parts of the diode and, and what actually goes into trying to come up with the equations for diodes, the more interesting it becomes and the deeper the understanding becomes. I should also mention that this slide deck is part of a larger document that you can find. Uh, I'll put in the links below, but if you go to Analogikus, Education, AIC 2024, you'll find the latest version of the diode chapter. And most of the what is being written down here is what I'm going to go through today. So if there's something you don't understand or something that doesn't make sense, or maybe <laughs> I say something wrong, then have a look in the uh, link below. In silicon, there we kind of need to compute the intrinsic carrier concentration. So how many electrons and holes are there? How many, it's not really free holes, but how many charges can actually move around at a given temperature? Because that gives us the conductivity or part of the conductivity. And it turns out that in most books, well, <laughs> in the in this uh, this one, uh, I probably won't be able to find it now, but quite early on, I think it actually is just says the intrinsic carrier concentration. Let's see if we can find it. It actually starts with this. It's uh, probably the first sentence in the book. Let's see. <coughs> intrinsic current, uh, intrinsic silicon. Let's see. Yeah, three electrons at room temperature. There are approximately one point one times ten to the ten carriers per cubic centimeters. So <coughs> it kind of says it's a constant. But in the next sentence, it says the number of carrier approximately doubles for every 11 degrees increase in temperature. So it's kind of important to know how many free carriers there are. So what's the function? Well, this is the function. We have the intrinsic carrier concentration on the left side. And on the right side, we have the square root of the density of states of electrons and uh, well electrons in the conduction band and holes in the valence band times e to the minus eg so this is the band gap divided by 2 kt so if you go if you if you don't recognize this equation and you don't recognize the the 1 over kt go to the refresher video and look at when I talk about Fermi Dirac statistics and the Fermi level. Because the part that you see on the right side here is really the Fermi level of intrinsic silicon. So that's the same as the band gap divided by two because the Fermi level, which is sort of the where, if there was a quantum state there, uh, a an electron would have a 50% probability of being in that quantum state. That's how we define the Fermi level. And that's halfway between the uh, valence band and the conduction band in intrinsic silicon. And then this part is <coughs> it's just the density of states as a function of energy. 
But where does this come from? And that's, that's sort of one of the challenges that I find quite often when I study electronics is that these kind of books, they make assumptions on what you know and that you actually remembered what you had in quantum physics and it, it assumes that you actually have had quantum physics and maybe you haven't. So let's go through it. The density of states, that's another equation. 2 times 2 pi kt, the mass, the effective mass of electrons divided by h squared to the power of 3 divided by 2. And for uh, the holes, it's just similar. Uh, the only difference is the uh, effective mass of holes. But what does this mean? And where does this come from? Well, before we get there, in your simulator, BSIM 4.8, for example, all this stuff, all this density of states and stuff, that's just extract abstracted away. So it's just a constant times some nominal temperature divided by uh, 300 Kelvin. Yeah. And then some sort of expression. And all the uh, magic of the density of states is gone. The band gap is still there, e.g. divided by 2k and so on. And if we take the, the, um, the model that is the intrinsic carrier concentration doubles every 11 degrees, and that's the uh, sort of simple one here. And we can see that that's definitely wrong when you get sort of outside of the uh, normal uh, human temperature range, or not, eh, even minus 25 is not that cold. I mean, outside here is today, it's minus 10 or something. And the green curve and the blue curve are the sort of full expressions, that's the blue, and the green is the BC 4 by 8. So these two, I think, actually just is a slight different in the uh, numbers that is been, has been put in. So. But where does this come from? Density of states. How many available states are there for electrons and holes to be in as a function of energy? And turns out, in order to compute that, we have to go all the way back to Schrodinger. And that is what is listed uh, top left here. So we have the wave function, we have the energy operator, and then the one on the uh, Laplacian here, that's going to be the second derivative, so this is the momentum. And here, there is no um, voltage <coughs> uh, multiplied by the wave function. So this is how we get the, I guess it's the um, time evolution of uh, the uh, wave function. Now, <clears throat> in order to get to where we want to go, we actually start in momentum space. So momentum space, given it's uh, inside the wave function here, we have uh, e to the i times k, which is the, um, uh, what's it called, the momentum vector? Momentum number? I don't remember. Uh, minus uh, omega t. Uh, but we only consider it in the momentum space, and that's what's sort of written here. It's the density of states in in a piece of momentum space. And the 2 divided by 2 pi to the power of p, and p is the dimensions. So here it's different, for example. The density of states is in silicon is different in a diode, where we consider a three-dimensional uh, momentum space, where versus a MOSFET, where we actually consider the uh, electron gauss in the channel as a two-dimensional uh, momentum space. So that changes the density of states in silicon, depending on what type of device we have. Now, we don't want to compute things in a momentum space. We actually have to go to the energy space. And there's that's where we use the, this transform from um, momentum space to the uh, energy. So h h bar squared k squared divided by 2 times the effective mass. Now <clears throat> this part, 
the, the conversion from momentum space to energy space, that is actually determined by the band structure. So here also, it the direction inside the crystal matters. <laughs> and if you're starting this video and haven't watched the refresher video, I really would encourage you to go back and do that because I'm now I'm just assuming that you've seen that and that you've sort of understood that. Okay, when we have a, a function for transforming from momentum space to energy space energy, uh, and we have the effective mass, it turns out that the effective mass that we want to use in the uh, this calculation of density of states is a function of the band structure. So uh, if you have momentum on the x-axis and energy on the y-axis, that has a certain function, and usually that's sort of a parabola or something like that. So that's what the effective mass here means. Uh, but um, uh, this second derivative, that's basically the, I guess it's the curvature of this band structure. Yeah. Yes, a curvature, which means that uh, the effective mass that's also dependent on direction in a unit cell. So where you fly in the silicon unit cell, the effective mass changes. And that's kind of interesting, which means that if you have a, a electrons traveling in this direction in the silicon lattice and travel in the other direction in the silicon lattice, they don't have to have the same effective mass. That can be different. So, we jumble the equations, we put them together to get a expression that gives us the density of states as a function of the energy for a piece of energy. <laughs> and that is given by this 2 divided by 2 pi and so on. Um, and the square root of the energy. So, to get from this, so the density of states as a function of energy, to get actually to the density of states per volume, we have to say something about the probability. We have to multiply this by the prob uh, not per volume, but we have to multiply this by prob the probability. And the probability is given by the Fermi Dirac statistics. So here we have the probability of a electron, for example, being in a certain quantum state given by the energy is given by the E minus the Fermi level divided KT plus 1. So now we can take, in order to compute the density of states for electrons, we can integrate this equation. So we have the density of states over energy and so on. And we end up with the expression that we had in the beginning. The density of electrons is 2 and then 2 pi m squared and so on. And here I've changed, and did I change the notation? I think I did. Yeah, probably. Because there's h bar in the, in the other one. So h bar is just um, uh, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Okay, so why is this important? Well, we have this equation for how many free carriers, or how many free electrons there are. And what's important is, well, okay, it depends on the band gap. It depends on the effective mass. And it depends on temperature. But that's really the, the things that change here. Now, in order to change the type of silicon, we usually dope it. We, we put in atoms in the silicon lattice that has one less or one more electron. For example, if we want to donate an electron, so have one more electron, we put in phosphorus. That's the um, NN here, and that creates a N-type material, so with abundance of uh, ele free electrons. And in that case, it turns out that the free electrons you get, it's, it's roughly, well, it's not entirely true, but it's mostly given by the doping. So the number of phosphor atoms you put into a piece of or a silicon volume, that gives you the density of uh, electrons. So that's why it says, the density of electrons in the n-type material is equal to the number of dopant 
dopants. And typical dopants are, I guess, 10 to the power of 22 or something per cu cubic meter. But even though we have an n-type material, there is actually holes there. The holes are the minority carriers in an n-type material. And how many holes there are, that is actually dependent on the intrinsic carrier concentration. So if we take the intrinsic carrying concentration squared divided by how many electrons there are, that has to be how many holes there are. And the same for the p-type material. The number of acceptor size, for example boron, that is equal to the number of holes and the number of electrons in the p-type material is given by the ni squared divided by na. So we have two different materials now. In one, the n-type, we have shifted the Fermi level closer to the conduction band, which means that we have more electrons. In the p-type material, we shifted the Fermi level closer to the valence band, which means that we have more holes. Now, Let's say, <laughs> uh, find the camera. So we have n-type material, p-type material. If we were able to make those independently, they would have different Fermi levels. But if I actually put them together, then the Fermi level cannot be different because if, if the Fermi level is different, then there's a flow of current because there's a voltage between. And difference in the Fermi level is exactly the same as the difference in voltage. So there's a force there, a force on the carriers. And if there's a force on the carriers, there is a movement on the carriers. So there's sort of a constant movement of carriers between the two materials until the two Fermi levels align. And in that case, we have what we call a band bending of the conduction band. Because well, I think this was the n-type material. Here we had the conduction band close to the... the um, uh, we had the Fermi level close to the conduction band, and in the p-type we have the Fermi level close to the... Well... We should really do all this. <laughs> so, imagine we have the conduction band and the valence band. And... Well, it's a bit slow, the capture here. And in between those two, there will be a Fermi level. Now, for that Fermi level, what I mentioned was, I'm going to draw the two on there. They will, they will eventually show up here. I'm going to draw first an n-type material. Hopefully it's not too laggy. I probably need to get a better computer or something. And a p-type. <coughs> so the Fermi level now is different. So the dotted line is the Fermi level for the p-type and the n-type material. But if I actually was able to put these materials in contact, then over time, the Fermi level has to become the same throughout the material, if it's at all conductive. And uh, of course, it can stay like this if there's a perfect insulator in between. But at some point, even over a perfect insulator, uh, you will align the Fermi levels, I think. It's like SSD drives. If you leave the SSD drives to the heat death of the universe, it's probably going to be the same Fermi level everywhere. But if I do align the Fermi levels, so if I take the p-type now and I move it up so the Fermi levels align, then I see something interesting. So... then there's sort of a gradient in the conduction band and the same in the valence band. Now a gradient like this is basically a voltage differential or it's an energy differential. 
So between the P side and the N side, there's a certain charge times a certain voltage. So an energy. And that energy difference is what we call the built-in voltage. And that will resist current flow after a while. And this is one of the fundamental things with diodes. We actually modify the conduction band and valence band in the material from one physical location to another physical location in such a manner that we create um, a situation where, where electrons only can go one way and holes can only go one way. Okay. I think actually this might be a minus here since it's electrons. I usually get it confused when it comes to voltages in, in the energy diagrams. It's it's confusing. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to the Yeah. So that's what happens when you dope things. That's how you get the PN junctions. Now <coughs> I think it's interesting to see where does this built-in voltage come from. Um, and in order to compute that, we actually have to know the density of electrons and the density of holes. We can both compute that from uh, the density of states uh, times the um, Fermi Dirac statistics, the probability of charge being in that state and then integrate over the energy levels. So for electrons here we've integrated over the conduction band and for P, well actually I think this integration is wrong. I think I should have integrated over the valence band here but it doesn't really matter. If we assume that the density of holes and uh, density of electrons is the same then we are left with an equation that tells us that the density of electrons divided by the density uh, wait a minute there's something funky here okay no both these are in the n-type material so the top one is the density of electrons the bottom one is the density of holes if we assume that the density of states is the same, then we end up with the difference between the, the electrons and holes in the n-type material is given by the difference in You see how confusing this is? <laughs> okay. I think I got it now. So Electrons, that's the first N. So electrons on the N side, the N-type material, is given by this equation, right? So the density of electrons on the N side. Uh, the density of electrons on the P side is given by the same equation. So they, it, it is actually correct to integrate from the conduction band up to infinity. Now, if we look across the, um, what we call the depletion region, or that band bending part, if we look at the density of electrons, the difference between the density of electrons on the two sides, not the difference, but the division, that's what we have here. So we have the density of electrons in the n-type material divided by the density of electrons on the p-type material is given by the difference in the Fermi levels divided by kT. Now, the difference in the Fermi levels, that is this built-in voltage that we talked about. So, if we go back to the iPad, this um, Q, what character is that? Theta? I don't know. This difference between the conduction band on the n-type material and the p-type material is given by the difference in the Fermi levels. That's kind of maybe intuitive. And that's why we can get 
the following equation for the built-in voltage because we know that the density of electrons on the p side the p type material that's given by the ni squared divided by the number of acceptors so if we insert that into this equation and we know that the number of electrons on the n-type side that is basically the number of donor sites so we insert that and well uh, we just insert this uh, q theta into the equation and we can rearrange it and now we can see that the difference in voltage between these two sides or the difference in energy if you take the q on the left side is given by kt so it's a function of temperature times the doping concentration divided by ni squared now you can't really measure this built-in voltage but it is uh, an important parameter for uh, diodes okay <laughs> that was a bit stumbly but this is not easy even for me okay now we get to current and this is harder i think but now we're talking holes. So the first P is the hole. So we have the hole concentration on the P side divided by the hole concentration on the N side. That is also given by the equation that we have here, obviously, because it's the same difference. Um, it's just that now we have a minus sign. Okay, so if we take the hole's concentration at the start of the the p side so this is uh, uh, and we have a holes concentration at a some point in the n side and we actually change the p side we add a voltage to the p side then now we actually have changed the fermi level somewhat and, and then this sort of increases the exponential <coughs> now on the n side well, uh, let's see, what's this? So we have P, X, and zero. So that's on the N side. And P, N, that's also holes on the N side. Yeah, so here it's basically given by the voltage difference. So this is where we are in the material on the N side. Okay. <laughs> And now we can set up the delta for the holes concentration on the N side. So if we take at some position, x0, this derivation is actually in the last chapter uh, in the analog integrated circuits and signal process, uh, analog integrated circuits book. And we subtract the hole concentration at the start of the bits, and this becomes an exponential. So think about it like this. On the P side, I have increased the voltage. So if I compare the number of electrons on the P side to the start of the depletion region or the end of the depletion region in the n-type material then I'm going to have the voltage I have plus I'm going to have the um, built-in voltage or not plus but minus in this case however when I look at the excess hole concentration on the n type in the n type material uh, at the end of the depletion region compared to what's normally there on the n side because normally there i have um, i now have an excess and that excess is given by a q uh, e to the qv divided by kt so it's kind of default without any voltage I have the top equation here that's my sort of uh, difference in uh, in holes and I modify the voltage which increases the voltage on the p side adding well 
uh, adding more holes or increasing the hole concentration. So this relationship becomes larger. And if I now compare how many more electrons, oh sorry, how many more holes do I have on the end side now than I used to have due to the voltage, that's what's given by this equation. Now I can find the difference between the two, so the xn0 minus the normal concentration, and that's given by this equation. So you have the default uh, hole concentration on the end side, the minority concentration, times an exponential, that is a function of voltage, the by kt, minus one. Now this is starting to look like our diode equation. What I need in addition now is going from uh, a difference in density of carriers into a current, and this is actually a diffusion current. So we have to use the diffusion current, uh, diffusion current, <laughs> and the diffusion current is actually given by uh, the charge, uh, how fast the holes move, and then the distribution of holes in the material. So we know the delta P, that's sort of an, the initial one, but how does that change as we move out through the n-type material? And it turns out that has an exponential. So uh, from the n-type material, we sort of have a certain concentration, and then it falls off exponentially as a function of length. It's, it's basically that um, the holes, excess holes on the n-side, they recombine and they recombine with an equal pr equal probability uh, of <laughs> in time. So, well, actually, as a function of distance, so as they progress through the material, the the number of excess holes diminishes exponentially. With those two, we can compute now the current density, and we can look at the current density at the end type uh, start. Okay, and when we do that, this is the equation we get. But w we can't just do this for holes, we also have to think about electrons, because both actually are part of uh, the diode current. So when we also then consider electrons, then we get the full equation for the diode current, which is the current is given by the charge of the electrons, the area of the diode. So here we had current density, now we have current, times the uh, intrinsic carrier concentration squared, times the uh, 1 over the acceptor atoms, so this gives us the minority concentration, or Ni squared divided by the Ni, Na, that gives us the minority concentration for electrons, and then we have to multiply that by the diffusion constant of electrons divided by the diffusion length of electrons, plus the same for holes, so the uh, intrinsic uh, carrier concentration squared divided by and D gives you the minority concentration for holes, and then times the diffusion constant for holes divided by the diffusion length for holes, times e to the qv divided by kt, minus one. And now, we have the full diode equation. So, a simple question. Given that we have a diode, so this is actually the same equation. Uh, let's just call this whole thing Is. <laughs> this is a current, it's a scaled current. Let's call the whole thing Is. And then let's ignore this one because this exponential increases very rapidly. So if I then rearrange and I wanna look at how does my diode voltage change as a function of temperature. Think about that. So uh, Vt here is Kt divided by Q, that's the thermal voltage. And then we have an, uh, an exponential, or sorry, uh, not an exponential, but a <laughs> logarithm of the current through the diode divided by the scale current. So which way does this diode voltage go as we increase the temperature. So this is kT divided by Q. So we sort of have T here as a proportionality constant. So the gut reaction for me and for many 
would be to say that the diode voltage increases as a function of temperature. So let's have a closer look. Okay, so let's split up the, uh, the logarithm into two. So we can get the diode current on one side and the scale current on the other side because we can need to figure out um, this ln is. So inserting for uh, the scale current, we get the intrinsic carrier concentration here. And we know that the intrinsic carrier concentration, that is a function of temperature. It has temperature in two points. You have it beneath the band gap here and you have it in the um, density of states. Now I just pulled out the uh, temperature invariant parts of the density of states into these B factors. So we have Ni is is proportional to T to the power of 3 divided by 2 and then there's an exponential with a T underneath the um, I never remember whether it's numerator or denominator. Doesn't matter, under the line. <laughs> we can simplify that a bit further. Now this first factor, 2ln and then the square root of... Um, hmm, interesting, why didn't I pull out the square root? Well, it doesn't matter. This lnbb thing, that's temperature independent. And then we have a 3t here. 3 lnt and then we have the band gap uh, voltage divided by the thermal voltage so inserting back into the equation for vd we can now see that vd is equal to kt divided by q which is the thermal voltage times some sort of factor minus three times the logarithm of t and then plus the band gap Okay, so then this L factor, th that's really just a constant, it's not a constant, but it's a temperature independent thing. So a couple of things we can see immediately. If we insert temperature equals zero, so absolute zero, the diode voltage is equal to the band gap voltage. So it's about 1.12 volts. Yeah? Cool. Okay. Then we know something more. We know a fixed point. <laughs> now we just need to know how it changes. Um, it's not immediately obvious what the derivative of this function is, whether it's positive or negative. At least to me, it's not immediately obvious. But if you insert realistic values, what you will see is that from, from a... Um, from absolute zero, it will go up a bit, and then it will quickly go down, and it will continue down. So if we plot it in a temperature range, more sort of normal, well, industrial operating temperature range, we will see that it is actually pretty much a decrease in the diode voltage as a function of temperature. And the sort of non-linear part of this decrease is actually quite small. It's a few millivolts. Um, now assuming uh, we center the graph on, uh, well, I guess in this case, 40, 50 degrees. It has sort of has this curvature. Now that's interesting. We now have, we can put a current into a diode and we can actually know how the temperature changes. Because we can measure, let's say we measure the voltage and we measure 0 0.85 volt. Well, if we have all the constants correctly, then we can know that we are at a high temperature. Now that's cool. But it kind of gets cooler. Because if we have two diodes set up in something that looks like the one on the right here. So we have a small diode, so that's the one, and then we have a big diode that is n times bigger. And then we set up the um, equation for that. So uh, we're using the current mirror on the op amp here to ensure that the current in the two diodes are is the same. So when we ensure that the current in those two diodes are the same, then we can set up this equation. We can take a logarithm on both sides, and it turns out that the difference in the um, 
diode voltages is given by kt divided by q times an ln ln on the size in between them now this n it doesn't have to be the size it actually is more the current density so we can also scale the current but anyway the voltage at the bottom point of the diode here and since we're using the op amp here the, the vd1 will be copied to the other side so the voltage across this resistor is assuming the op amp is ideal and perfect exactly kt divided by q ln to the, the size difference that's proportional to temperature and it is if the op amp is ideal and the current mirror is ideal and the size difference is known that is exact which means the current from this thing we can actually just copy this gate voltage to well we can take the gate voltage to another transistor and get a current output and we can generate a current that is proportional to temperature now of course it's not easy <laughs> because there's an op amp in here and an op amp needs you well the offset offset of the op amp matters the gain of the op amp matters the mismatch in the current meters matters so it's definitely not easy but principle is there it's possible okay that's what i wanted to go through today have a fantastic day